When you program a computer, it does exactly what you tell it to do. It's like designing a machine, any machine, like a car, a faucet, like a gas hinge for a door, using math and instructions. It's awesome in the truest sense. It can fill you with awe. A computer is the most complicated machine you will ever use. It's made of billions of micro-mineralized transistors that can be configured to run any program you can imagine. But when you sit down at the keyboard and write a line of code, those transistors do what you tell them to. Most of us will never build a car. Pretty much none of us will ever create an aviation system, design a building, lay out a city. Those are complicated machines. Those things, and they're off limits to the likes of you and me. But a computer is like 10 times more complicated, and it will dance to any tune you play. You can learn to write simple code in an afternoon. Start with a language like Python, which was written to give non-programmers an easier way to make the machine dance to their tune. Even if you only write code for one day, one afternoon, you have to do it. Computers can control you, or they can enlighten your work. If you want to be in charge of the machine of your machines, you have to learn to write code. That was written by Corey Doctorow in Little Brother, pages 119 to 120. If anyone asks why we are using Python, that is why. It gives us a way to put it back into the teenagers' hands. Right, my name is Jerry McManus. I'm a secondary school teacher at St. Bede's College in Christchurch. We are no longer teaching Office, just Office. We are no longer teaching Microsoft Word, Spreadsheets, <laughs> Access. There is one slight problem though. There are some schools that are. They have not seen the light. We have a history of computing in New Zealand with the majority looking at office that, that looks at office productivity tools. Those still exist, yet we need people to make that change. Eight years ago, the technology achievement standards came out. We saw these as a possible way to deliver programming into schools, but it came down to a technology process, a technology process that does not fit programming. We had the digital technology guidelines. These here were going to be our possible enlightening tool for teachers to start creating courses to include web design, to include multimedia, to look at infrastructure, to look at electronics, to look at all these fantastic things that computers now offer. Yet the ministry decided not to give them any light of day by not providing any achievement standards for them. It took a report by Grimsey up in AUT to basically tell the Ministry of Education that what they were doing was wrong. That came digital technologies. Digital technologies gave us a way. It looks at digital information. Yes, we still have digital information which looks at Word, which looks at Excel, which looks at Access, but it moves it through. It pushes those teachers to start thinking not just Word, but as someone said before, relational databases. Unfortunately, that is a level three skill. Level two requires them to create linked data. And you can link data through MySQL and PHP. So it started opening up some avenues for some teachers of little wee snapshots of what they could actually do. Digital media, web design, video production, animation, blender can all be done. These students now have a way to start being creative within their courses. Programming and computer science. This is what I'm going to talk about today. There is also digital infrastructure. Getting students to actually look at networks, look at what is inside the computer, pull it apart, put it back together, try and get it working. It looks at, well, uh, looks at WANs, looks at LANs, looks at the um, setting up wireless access. It opens these kids up to a whole new avenue. A number of schools have also started looking at the Cisco courses around us. And we also have electronics. Electronics is now under digital technologies, even though a number of people wish it wasn't. The history. This is what's happened in the last oh, three years. 
2008, the New Zealand Computer Society report came out, which basically said, nah, what you're doing is wrong. We've had the UK push. The UK push that happened this year and last year, we had it in 2008. We had our association formed to the NZ Act Act in 2009. We had recommendations that were put together by industry leaders, the DTEP, in 2009. Every other, every other curriculum area had that a year before. We have been playing catch up. We had a, a symposium that had nothing put together, yet 150 teachers signed up immediately and then developed, and then the push started. Level 1 was introduced last year. That's uh, for fifth, fifth form or year 11 or level 1, as people now look at it. Yet level 2 was introduced this year and has created a number of issues and changes. Level 3 is next year. Right, which programming language? Why Python? This is taken from um, the National Computing, uh, the NCSS over in Australia. Python strikes right balance between simplicity and power. Python is an excellent first programming language to learn, yet it is powerful enough to build industrial strength applications. Google and Industrial Light and Magic use Python extensively. Programs can be run interactively by the interpreter, enabling experimentation and making visualisation and debugging simpler. So, right, level one programming. 3,245 students took programming last year. That is unprecedented. 31.8% not achieved. Yet 32, 18 and 17% achieved it. And, and hopefully they've taken it up this year. Level one looks at a programming language that could be graphical, drag and drop or text based. The language chosen must support data types, procedural structures, and good comment facilities. What is needed for level one is construct a basic computer program. It needs variables, sequence, selection, iteration, control structures, predefined actions, and input from a user or other source. What schools have come up with is we use Scratch. Why Scratch? doesn't require any syntax. It is straight kids drag drop. They learn what the if, if else statement is. They learn what variables are. They can set up arrays. They can go through. This is a simple game which basically says, which is the biggest number? Nine. And it should say, welcome to the guessing game. No. Um, my name's Jared. You must get eight questions right. What is the biggest number? Three. That's correct, which is the smallest number, four. Now, a student's gone through and created this. All of a sudden, we're starting to see and statements. We're starting to see comparisons. We're starting to see if and else statements. We've got the beginnings of a kid that is beginning to understand what programming is. Now, that's not bad for a, a week's work. And when you start thinking about it, that there is probably 40 minutes a period. So that's been done in less than four hours. Then we've got statements on each of the cards. Now, they haven't quite got their statements right, but it's creating a really good understanding about what computing or what programming could be. Level two, it is prefer preferable for the programming language for the standard to be text-based. Any language chosen must support index data structures, modules with parameters, global and local scope of variables, and a good comment document facility. Now, an advanced program must have those features. So, what we've got is... Right. This is a possible solution to a given problem. It is a pizza data, it is a pizza delivery system. It requires a user to enter in um, run it. Right, welcome to the pizza database. Right, it must have a specific number of comment um, 
specific number of characters. How many pizzas? I'm after two pizzas. It gives me a list of pizzas. This is brought in through an array. So all of a sudden, students are starting to think about how they're going to store the information. So I feel like one pizza and a number two. Uh, proceed with the order. It's going to be $17. Right, for mushroom and olive and an anchovy and caper with a delivery fee. Proceed with the order, yes. Order confirmed, two with another order. So we're starting to get repetition within our program. So this is what the kids have to come up with. They have to be able to comment. They have to be able to lay out their program properly. They have to be able to use functions and also give us descriptions of what is going on. Now, that's a year, that's probably a 16, 17 year old having to come up with those, um, those parts. Level three is draft at the moment. There are still possibly changes to be made. But the programming language for this standard must be a text-based, object-orientated programming language that supports graphical user interfaces and event-based programming. Python has that. What we're required to do is to be able to do all this. That is a complex program. That is worth six credits to a student. That is half a year's work. When you look at it, we see the kids for roughly 120 hours a year. So 60 hours for a kid to learn, develop, test, and then go through and do his assessment. Not bad. We're seeing the demos. Right. Now, we have these wonderful resources. Code Academy, absolutely brilliant. Try Python, absolutely brilliant. We also have resources that have been put up by the University of Otago. No, sorry, uni yeah, no, sorry, University of Canterbury. Basically, these are the resources that are available that have been found for free. A student has sat there and gone through every single one and basically looked at how it could be, whether it's suitable for a secondary school kid. So there is literally thousands of resources out there to help, pro help with programming in secondary schools. Now, what's great about the Code Academy, and a number of those ones, is they're great for revision. Please don't use them for testing. The idea is these kids need to be able to put the assessment into practice. Sitting there, using the program at home is great for revision, but they need to know what nuances are required for the assessment. That there is one of the biggest, um, biggest things that I see as possible problems. University of Otago has come on board, which is brilliant. They've gone through and created a whole entire textbook to help teachers and students to be able to go through and understand what is required. It is full of programming problems. So in around about 106 pages, they can learn from strings, so doing things practically for strings. The repetition, um, if else, so billions and selections, getting input, modular programming, and it also helps them with what's required for their assessment later on. So it gives students examples of how the composer's list in an array could look. Um, we thank them for their excellent work um, because without that, a lot of teachers would be stuck. So other things that we're sort of looking at is we're looking at ways to get students to interact. It's great them being able to go out, try things at home, but how do we know what they're doing at home is actually going to work? The University of Canterbury, through Richard Lobb, has created a in-source uh, sandbox within Moodle. Um, it uses the PyPy sandbox, which he's modified, and is basically putting to use. So I'm able to go through. Right, I have a wonderful example here. So right, how do I know that this function's gonna work? I'm required to do a double, so it's a simple one. Create a function, return, check. So straight away I can s uh, I should have gone into that earlier. So straight away, and go in. So if a student goes through and goes right, and then checks it, 
he can immediately see whether he got his test cases right or wrong. So all of a sudden it's providing straight away feedback to the student on what he's designed and developed is going to work. We're basically looking at these things being used more to help the students create an understanding at home, homework. Uh, most of them don't like that. But if they're starting to see, if they're starting to get information back straight away, they get more engaged with it. It creates a competitive environment which boys like and they really get um, angry when um, the code doesn't work properly. Um, there's another number of competition, or there is one competition that I know of out there. It is the, uh, the NCSS Challenge. It has three levels. So what we can do is courses. Please don't tell me I'm logged out, no. Right, so if I'm an intermediate student on programming, I can go through. It's made available for students. This is basically around students' work, so magic squares. Here's my problem. I'm required to go through and create a program which basically says if the order that I input these is correct, it will then go through. So these are competitive environments that students can use at home to actually develop their understanding and challenge themselves against others throughout the world. Um, another one, if you're a student and you're after something to do in your holidays, Catalyst. Now they're one of the sponsors of this, I didn't quite know that, but what I'm sort of saying is Catalyst run an open source academy. What they do is they allow students to experience what it's like working for an open source company. Um, I had a student do this last year. He learnt uh, putting his own web server together, securing it, Python, a little bit of JavaScript, HTML, and started doing unit tests to help support Koha. So if it's something that you're interested in for a summer internship and you're between the ages of I think 14 and 18, it could be something that you could be interested in. Um, this is sort of my mantra. Um, schools should not only explore how ICT can supplement traditional ways of teaching, but also how it can open up new and different ways of learning. This is in the New Zealand curriculum, it's on page 36. We need to challenge teachers to start thinking about new and interesting ways of engaging students. In the next 10 years, you're sitting in front of laptops, so will students within the next couple of years. Primary schools are already doing it with iPads. Secondary schools are now starting to move as well. The only things we're stuck on is NZQA and the assessment procedures that, have, that are there. They are still very much written. I have some questions. What was your first programming language and has, how has it shaped your programming ability? Assembler. Assembler? Pascal. Pascal? BBC Basic. BBC Basic? <laughs> yeah. I love the old BBC. ZX81. Huh? ZX81 Basic. Commodore 64 Basic. Oh, now we're going way back. Gee. How has it shaped your programming ability, though? Did it give you a good foundation? Yeah. No. <laughs> Pascal, did it give you a good foundation? No, I found that it was, it was great to start with and, and trigger an interest. Yeah. I didn't really understand how to program until after university. Yeah. Same with me. When I start thinking about some of the programming languages I've had, it sparks an interest. I see Python as being that way to spark an interest in high school students. We use Python's IDLE for development at present. What others would you suggest for students? Python. There doesn't seem to sort of be a consensus. There's four different ones at the moment. <laughs> Not Emacs. Not Emacs. Oh. It's really funny. Um, one of the things that we started thinking about is we want students to be um, to start thinking differently about their development environments, things like that. 
Um, what we have access to is, um, where's my server starting to look at jumping on board to help us? Um, we want development environments at home for students as well as at school. Where's my server could possibly be a way to help with that? I know there's the Raspberry Pi, but when you look at the $52 for Raspberry Pi, plus the power adapter, plus the HDMI to DVI cable, plus the keyboard, plus the mouse, plus the SD card, it starts raising it up to around about $115. Where's my server? The deal that we're starting to look at is going to not even be that. So it basically gives the students a way to actually go through, put Python on a server, also do web development, and also bits of others. They have their own server. If they muck it up, they can restore their snapshot. So the students get to play with server technology at the same time. So, yeah, it gives them a bit of a challenge. Um, what would be one thing you would change in high schools around digital technologies? I'm really, it's really hard at the moment because I think I know a couple of students are watching and I'm probably going to agree with you. <laughs> they would love to see some of the teachers change. Um, not, not so much teachers with the skills to do the job, but there's a lot of teachers out there who don't have the skills but still have the job. Yeah. And this requires... It requires a major step up in skills. It requires interest. It oh, yeah. Hence the reason why a number of skills are still teaching unit standards. Is either the teachers don't have the skills, or as someone said before, here's something new I have to learn each year. I have to relearn Adobe CS every two years. I have to relearn uh, programming languages as they change. New courses, new standards, new everything. I sit back, and I'm sorry for the English teachers that are possibly going to watch this, but how much has English changed in the last five years? How much has maths changed? How much has science changed? How much has digital technologies changed? It is an ever-changing beast. And the last thing is, what version of Python? Three. Three. Um, we're using 3. The competition sites use 2.73. The inherent change is the brackets around the print statement. Consistency. 3 was built to add consistency and expectation of behaviour. Yeah. 3 is better for the makes the print function more in line with the other. Yeah. And it will deal with Unicode and the Maori language goes into Unicode. Deals with it much better. Um, basically, sends people up to relearn Python if you're teaching Python too. There we go. We have to relearn yet another part. But for me, I was straight away started with three. The biggest problem was the programming competition sites is 2.7. And that has been the hardest thing to get the students to drop back to. They're so used to putting their brackets around. And when they run their program, it's, oh, error. Oh, penalty point, and it's kind of ah. Keeps them from future import print statement. Okay. Yeah. Also, it works should, in two seven. Ah. They should be able to use Python two point seven just for the front end to check it before they submit. Yeah, yeah. But it's uh, it sort of takes some of that fun away. It's sort of I've got to throw it through something else to be able to check it. It's sort of like, it's sort of right. If a student thinks they've got it, why should they have to go through that process? I know it then comes down to testing, which is what we're trying to get the kids to start thinking about anyway. Um, both of those parts, that, uh, programs that I showed you, um, worked. They, they're extremely well. But because the teachers and the students haven't gone through the specifications, um, they, don't, they struggle to actually get um, achieved. Um, this one here. Not bad, 25 minutes. What I might do is I'll run questions with the microphone. Oh. <laughs> um, come on. 
load. That's what we're pushing for. Radio, that's what that is. Right, for the Dream Pizza. For the program, Dream Pizzas wants to computerise their phone orders. Specifically, they want to be able to enter customer details, pizzas ordered, pick up delivery requirements. Your program must meet the following specifications. If a student misses one of those specifications, it's not achieved. Is this the way it should be? But you're doing that in business. You guys are developing programs with specifications that have been delivered by the employer, by, by your... <laughs> no? So this is an unrealistic example of a, um, of a way it works in business? Yep. Now, no, that's not the stuff I'm talking about. It's all stuff. Okay. You, you are so going to like this statement then. Do we need to run? <laughs> How do you show flexibility in programming? Um, we'll do a few more organised questions. I think we have a hand up here. <laughs> Is there anywhere we can access these um, these uh, papers, these NCA papers? Um, the NCA papers on the TK, on the TKI website. Um, do we make these presentations available outside? Um, presentations available to you to put up on a website? These are being recorded and will be available. Yes. Cool. Um, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? How we have flexibility is now. I'll choose and... Do you think there's any scope or room to have maybe some small private uh, teaching facilities that parents could pay for outside of school? Funny thing about that, with the Christchurch rebuild, they're looking at creating hubs. So if the school does not have the teacher available to be able to teach these things, these kids could be actually able to be bussed in and go through one of those hubs and through one of those developments. That is probably a little bit away yet, but I'm so hoping. We're, what we're starting to see is we're starting to see t parents that are involved with their primary school kids at the moment and starting to move their way through. So we're hoping some of those technical experts will be able to follow through and help those schools that are struggling. We've also recognised the fact that these are only going to work in urban secondary schools. What about the rural schools? What about on the west coast? What about um, Awakuni? What about... Um, oh, where was another one that was put together? What about Gore? How are those schools going to offer some of these standards? We're also looking at possible ways of using video conferencing facilities and online learning to help support those schools and students but as these are new standards, as the teachers are now starting to grapple with those things, it's possibly still a little bit away. I would love to see it, but I know it's not going to be realistic within the next year and a half. Um, just a, almost an answer to that. Canterbury has just started a computer yes, club. Yes, they have. And when we started it, it kind of looked like we might get 10 or 15 kids Within a few you weeks, got more. It, it had blown over 35. We've got so many people involved. Tim's had to put a cap on it. it. Teaching Python to young kids, um, which will really help prepare them for this kind of thing. Mm. It's been incredibly popular. Um, there's one kid who's basically already skipped everything that's been given to him already. Yeah, there's and he's one now starting to work on level two, <laughs> level uh, almost first year university work. Yeah, Richard Lobb's working with him one on one. Yeah. He's that good. But there are some of these kids around that are out there. How do we support those students within schools as well? Um, so now we've heard a computer club in Christchurch. Somebody's just approached me after my little spiel before saying we've got a computer club that we're self-funding down the corner. It, it, it seems to me that it's a really difficult job for you to support the people who really want to get into this in a school setting and maybe outside the school setting. Is there some way of getting people to not have to form these things off their own back to get some sort of 
This is where the Ministry of Education could be <laughs> one of those ways. Unhelpful. Um, the learning education outside the classroom. At the moment, most of those monies and facilities goes towards museums, goes towards um, educational partners that have been found that have been founded years ago. This could be an opportunity to actually um, create something different to help support that. So it's basically looking at what we could get through the ministry as work for a um, an Oscar program, which is sort of like the um, the after school programs could be another avenue for it. But the uh, it would just require someone to be creative in their application process. But as you, but then it would only be for that region for that community. It's how do we look at the the two four six club. That happens up, or the two seven. There's a club that happens in Otara, looking at getting com kids using computers outside of the school. How do we get those clubs happening throughout the rest of New Zealand? More of a statement than a, um, a question, but isn't this about lighting the fuse? Yes. How many children out of a hundred would you find that have a, a strong aptitude towards becoming a future hacker? Um, and before you answer that, just let me follow on and say, <laughs> isn't this about identifying those people and lighting the fuse and letting them know that they don't need any permission to go ahead and change the world? As long as they've got a computing device and an internet connection, they can go do it. Yes. Yes. But how do we get management to also look at that and technicians within schools that want to lock down everything as much as possible? Are there any resources you could suggest for teaching primary school children for coding? It's Scratch. Scratch, Scratch, Scratch. Go on, find the Scratch website. There is literally there are millions of programs that kids have created. It's getting the kids to jump on, pull them apart, become, become the hacker of old. Um, the original hackers went through and used to go through the programming drawer, look at people's code and figure out ways to, to enhance it, make it better. That's, that's what the old, um, the old universities over in the States used to do when they got old tar, when they got their old computers, is the programmers created programs, stuck them in the drawer, people would open it up and go, I can do something better than that. They would go through, do it. Get the students to hack. Get the students to hack together code, play. Okay, we're a bit out of time, but thank you very much, Sharon.